Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Hello, Professor Donald. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Such an honor to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind invitation, Marwa. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to ask you first, maybe, I know everyone, almost know everyone about you, but how you would like to define yourself? Maybe for, maybe for first time, someone listening to you, how you would like to define yourself? Well, I, I've been a professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California at Irvine. I'm, I'm now um, Professor Emeritus. I've been studying um, visual perception, mm. mathematical models, computational models of how we see in 3D, how we see uh, objects and their shapes and colors. And then more recently started to look at perception from an evolutionary framework, mm. trying to ask the question, does natural selection shape sensory systems to see truths about objective reality or not? And it looks like it's the or not. And, mm -hmm. and then studying a little bit about uh, the nature of consciousness and its relationship to the brain. The hard problem was called the hard problem of consciousness that was known all the way back in the 1700s to Gottfried Leibniz. He understood that problem very, very well. And 300 years later, we're still scratching our heads about it. So I'm, 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 I'm scratching my head about that fun problem. So those are the kinds of things that I've been enjoying doing. Yeah. So we'll go for that, but we'll ask every guest about their childhood. I don't know how, how was your childhood was. Because you just, it's just this kind of thing is what, what kind of childhood did you have? Well, my, my parents uh, had an interesting background. They both mm -hmm. were well educated. My dad had a master's degree in chemistry and my mother had a bachelor's in biology. Uh, and so they, they knew the sciences, but they were also uh, tied up in fundamentalist Christianity. My dad eventually then became a, a, a pastor in a fundamentalist church. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so they had some religious ideas as, as well. And so as a teenager, I started to have to wrestle with the obvious contradictions between the points of views, the, the one that, that uh, said that we should think about space, time, and matter as fundamental and mm -hmm. use the tools of science to describe it. And the other that, that um, tended to say the Earth is only 6,000 years old and uh, it had views that contradicted science. And so as a teenager, I, I finally sharpened the question myself um, in terms of, are we machines? Are, are people just machines? And already as, as a high school student, I was programming. This is in the early years of programming. And my mother was quite an accomplished programmer. She was very, very sharp at programming. Uh, and, and she got me into it um, when I was maybe in 11th grade or something like that. I was already mm -hmm. programming. So, so I was interested in that and artificial intelligence. Could what, what, what kind of intelligence could machines have? And so I, for me, I sharpened the question to be, are we just machines? Are people just machines? And I so I, I eventually went to uh, the artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT for my graduate work. So I was in the AI lab at MIT, also in what's now called the brain and cognitive sciences department at MIT. And so you can see those two are getting at the human side, the neurobiology and, and the psychology of, of what it means to be a human being, but also then the artificial intelligence side. Mm -hmm. And so I was really quite interested in trying to get the, the right tools to understand the answer to that question. I've been studying that question for the rest of my life. <clears throat> Wonderful. Yeah. So I think most of the, your talk and what you try to say about what, what actually the reality is, what we are really living in. And I think one of the interesting parts you say that, of course, we see that everything's through interfaces, and you can elaborate more what you mean about interfaces. But you mentioned something very interesting that evolution don't want to tell us, don't want to let us know what this reality is and purpose. And sometimes it's not very, very and I think that's something powerful to, what do you mean? Why do you think that happening? And what do you mean about interfaces? Because I think that's something very interesting. Right. So <clears throat> a lot of us have intuitively questioned 
our percent our perceptions we we sometimes ask you know for example do you see the same colors that i see or could your colors be completely different from mine and and more generally do we see the world as it is or not and most of us intuitively think that we're probably seeing most of reality as it is i look up and i see the moon you look up and you see the moon and and we both tend to agree about what we're seeing or i see an apple on the table and I say it's red and has a certain shape and you you tend to agree with me. So we we tend to believe that um, we're seeing reality as it is. How could we question that? How could we actually try to ask technically the question, do we see reality as it is? You, you might say, well, you'd have to know what reality is to know whether your perceptions match to it. And how could you ever know what reality was to compare reality with your perceptions? And so so that, that seems like a, a logical bind that we're in. So the approach that I took was to say, all we can do as scientists is to take our best current theories and ask, what do they mathematically entail? And so that's what I decided to do with our best theory right now in this area, which is evolution by natural selection. <clears throat> so I asked, starting around 2007, 2008, uh, what does evolution by natural selection entail? Does it entail that sensory systems would be shaped to see some aspects of reality as it is or, or not. And, and that's really, I think, the, a, a key point here. And that, that is that what we do is we take our best current scientific theories and look at their logical implications. Uh, it doesn't mean that I believe our best current theories. I'm not saying evolution by natural selection is true or the final word or anything like that. All I'm saying is it's the best tool we have right now. Of course, as scientists, we're always looking to break our tools make new, deeper theories um, that, that go beyond. <clears throat> but we have to start with where we are. So, so for me, the idea was let's take evolution, which is our best tool for understanding the evolution of sensory systems and see what it entails. Now, most of us would think that it entails that we see some truths. And the argument that comes to mind is those of our ancestors who saw reality more accurately would of course, have a competitive advantage uh, in the everyday activities of life, feeding, fighting, fleeing and mating. And therefore, they certainly should be more likely to pass on their genes, which code for the more accurate perceptions. So after thousands of generations of that, uh, it seems very likely that we're the offspring of those who saw reality more accurately. And so we see, in the normal case, reality as it is. Again, I don't think anybody says we see all of reality as it is, uh, but we see those aspects that we need to survive in our niche. And <clears throat> that's that's a very compelling intuitive argument and, and very accomplished uh, evolutionary theorists have, have given that kind of argument. So this is not just, you know, the, the man on the street who doesn't know anything who, who makes this kind of argument. This is a uh, very competent evolutionary theorists have made this argument because mm -hmm. it's so intuitively compelling. But yeah. we don't have to go with intuition on this. We don't have to wave our hands. We don't have to argue. Evolution by natural selection is a mathematically precise theory. So John Maynard Smith, uh, a British mathematician in the 1970s, used the tools of game theory to formalize the basic ideas of Darwin, the, the, the evolution by natural selection. And so now we can use evolutionary game theory to ask very precise questions about the evolution of sensory systems. And so Around 2008, I got a couple graduate students interested in this, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, and we started off just by doing, they ran hundreds of thousands of um, simulations of, of you know, artificial organisms that were in foraging games. And we let some of them see reality and others not to see reality, and we just looked at what would happen. And what, what we saw was intriguing. We saw that the organisms, you know, artificial organisms that saw reality as it is, were not out competing organisms of equal complexity that saw none of reality and were just allowed to see the fitness payoffs. And, it, and that's a key notion in evolution is the notion of fitness payoffs. Whatever the world is, um, the state of the world, it will have consequences for you. And the consequences depend on what kind of creature you are. So being 5,000 meters underwater is great for a benthic fish, but it would be terrible for me. So whatever reality might be, um, the consequences, the fitness payoffs could be wildly different for different creatures. Eating um, 
certain kinds of berries could kill me that, that may be the source of life for another animal. Um, eucalyptus leaves, for example, and, and koalas. I mean, if I eat eucalyptus leaves, I'd be in bad trouble, but that's all the uh, koala can eat. <clears throat> so, so, that, so the fitness payoffs depend on objective reality, but they vary wildly across creatures. And so, so then armed with those um, simulations, I decided that it, there might be a theorem here. So I, I proposed a, a couple ideas to a colleague of mine, Chaitan Prakash. And, and Chaitan's a, a very brilliant mathematician, and we worked on it together, but, but he's, the, he's the mathematician, not me. And we've uh, published a couple papers. And the, the bottom line is this. The probability is zero that any sensory system of any organism sees any aspect hmm. of the structure of objective reality, according to evolution by natural selection. Probability is precisely zero precisely zero and so what that means is that our perceptions the very language of space and time and physical objects shapes and colors and motions and textures and so forth also all of our senses so smells the the the, the auditory perceptions that we're having the, the hearing and so forth the very predicates of our sensory systems the very language of our sensory system is simply the wrong language to describe objective reality. So I'm saying I'm not saying something merely like uh, we get the shapes a little bit off, or the colors a little bit off, or the distances a little bit wrong. I'm, I'm saying that the language of shapes, colors, distances, and so forth could not possibly frame a true description of objective reality according to natural selection. It's mm -hmm. just the wrong language. And, and so that's that's a, a stunning result. And, and one just intuition, you might ask, well, how, you know, how could that be? What's wrong with the original argument that I just gave that said that if you see the truth, you're more likely to pass on your genes? And, and, and the argument, the intuition is this. <clears throat> the payoff functions that drive natural selection are functions that depend on objective reality whatever objective reality might be. So the question is, so suppose objective reality has some structure to it, like a total order or some symmetry group or a topology or a measurable structure. So some mathematical structure that the question is, what is the probability that a payoff function will be what mathematicians call a homomorphism of that structure, that it will actually preserve that structure, that it will contain information about mm -hmm. say that total order or that, that measurable structure. Well, it turns out that one can actually use combinatorial arguments to compute precisely that probability. And so we have a paper for those who are interested and want to get past just a, a little interview and want to see the math. Um, it, there's a paper called Fact, Fiction and Fitness, just came out a few months ago, Fact, Fiction and Fitness. Or if you Google my name in that paper, you can actually see the math, the combinatorics. And what, what Chaitan proved is that uh, the set of payoff functions that preserve the various kinds of structures, we looked at symmetry groups, um, total orders, measurable structures, the set of payoff functions that actually contain information about the structure has probability zero. Mm -hmm. And so we go through that, that argument there. So what that means is natural selection can only shape sensory systems according to the information in the payoff functions. The payoff functions don't contain information about the structure of the world. Hmm. Therefore, natural selection is tuning us to something other than the structure of the world. And, and so that raises, there's a couple questions I think that people naturally have at, at this point. One is first, Natural selection is only part of evolution, right? There's all sorts of aspects to evolution. Why have I focused on natural selection? There's genetic drift, there's linkage, there's pleiotropy, there's the constraints from physics and chemistry. Uh, some evolutionary biologists have argued that uh, selection pressures are a relatively minor aspect of evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton, for example, um, have sort of attacked the adaptationist point of view on, on evolution. and and. It, for all I know, 
they may be right that natural selection is a very, very minor aspect of evolution. That's, that's you know, that's for technical experts in the field of evolutionary theory to, to work out. And I don't know the answer there. But, but here's why I focused on natural selection. To the extent that people think that evolution might have shaped us to see the truth, they say the, the, the reason is that seeing the truth will make you more fit. That's a natural selection argument. So that's why I went after natural selection. No one argues that genetic drift will make you see the truth. It couldn't. How could genetic drift, just random drift of genetic, mm. you know, genetic code, change change your system so that you see the truth? How could linkage and plyotropy do this? The only tool that evolutionary theory might have that, that could conceivably, we would hope, shape our systems to see the truth is natural selection. And so that's why I used evolutionary game theory because that's the tool that focuses on natural selection. So, 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 and, and once again, I'm not assuming that I know what objective reality is. I don't need to assume it. The, the tool is so powerful. It lets me say that whatever the structure objective reality might have, we don't see it according to natural selection. And I'm not assuming the truth of evolutionary theory. Um, I'm free to conclude that, for example, a deeper theory might entail that we do see the truth. But what I am saying is we don't have such a deeper theory right now. Right now, the only tool we have in this area is evolution. And the only aspect of it that could give us an answer is natural selection. And the answer of natural selection is the probability is zero that we've been shaped to see reality. So, so the other natural question is, well, if we don't see reality, what what in the world do we see? What, mm. what, what has evolution shaped our senses to report and why, if it's not the truth? I mean, what else, what else could be useful? And I think a useful way of thinking about it is that evolution has shaped us, and we would all understand this from, from natural selection, it shaped us with sensory systems that guide adaptive behavior. That we understand, right? It is trying to help us to act in ways so that we survive long enough to reproduce. Yeah. And, and so I just say, that's it, full stop. It just gives us sensory inputs that give us adaptive actions, that guide adaptive actions. So think about a user interface on your, on your computer, on your desktop, right? If you see a blue icon on the middle of your screen, this blue and rectangular, middle of your, your screen for, say, a, a paper you're writing or an email you're, you're writing, that, that doesn't mean that the email in your computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your computer. I mean, anybody who thought that misunderstands the whole point of the user interface. It's there to, quote unquote, guide adaptive action, right, to let you use the computer in a useful fashion. But it does it by hiding the true complexity of the computer. You don't want to know about the diodes and resistors, and you don't want to have to toggle mil millions of voltages to write an email. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good metaphor for what evolution gave us. It gave us eye candy, a user interface that lets us control reality as much as we need without knowing anything at all about the reality that we're controlling, right? We pay good money for a user interface on our, on our laptops <clears throat> to maintain our ignorance about the reality of the computer. I don't want to know about the voltages and magnetic fields in the computer. So that's what evolution gave us. Or think about playing a game of a, a virtual reality game, like you know, a, a virtual version of Grand Theft Auto. Right? <clears throat> you see very simple things, a, a virtual steering wheel, a dashboard, other cars, and so forth, a gas pedal, brake. What you're really doing in that metaphor is toggling millions of voltages per second in some supercomputer somewhere. Mm -hmm. But all you see yourself doing is turning a steering wheel left and right. And you can understand a steering wheel. You couldn't possibly toggle millions of voltages per second in just the right pattern that you would need to win the game. If someone tried to do that, I mean, someone with just a steering wheel is going to win the game over someone who's trying to toggle voltages by hand millions of times a second. And so that's what evolution gave us was this, this VR headset, a virtual reality headset that lets us play the game of life without knowing what the objective reality is. So yeah. space time is just our headset. We've thought about space and time as the fundamental reality that came into existence 13.8 billion years ago. 
and that mm -hmm. we're latecomers on that that pre-existing stage. And I'm saying it's just the opposite. We're not little creatures inside space-time. Rather, space-time is merely a data structure that we employ to interact with reality, but that hides reality. So space-time is not the reality. It's a trivial interface that hides a much more complex reality. So as, as complicated as space-time feels to, to us, it's a trivial data structure compared to the more complex reality that we're interacting with. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you a question, very interesting what you say about the fitness, since fitness is a very important element here. Why humans, for example, don't have fissures or why we are designed certain shape like that to adapt to the environment and that what we have is this behavior. How do you see the correlation between the fitnesses we have and the objective reality? Do you think if we already know what is happening in reality, it could be harmful? Because you mentioned for some people, for example, the example you mentioned for some women, perhaps they can imagine different kind, not all women. I mean, that's something you say about this kind of functionality you have. But I'm wondering, and I think one of the examples very interesting you said about when you, when you looked at the mirror, you see the skin. And funnily enough, when I was very young, I was looking to the mirror um, for a long time. And I, I was look, looking because I'm, I, I find myself beautiful, ugly, like that. I just have weird feeling that there's something I can't even understand. I remember this feeling that I look into this mirror and I feel so something beyond me. I didn't understand what is this actually. And do you think that if we don't really understand what is actually more complex, because you say that it is very maybe we don't need to understand how the computer is designed or how this is a complicated system, but I think at a certain point we need to understand so that we can design what we really want. If we don't understand how the computer is designed, we still we don't figure it out. And you say that even people who don't really care, we will also survive to the design. But how is the correlation between us and objective reality? What could be a component, do you think, if we understand, if you came up with a mathematical modeling for that, or maybe later, what could be a component, do you think, is missing beyond space and time, this trivial representation, but maybe other element, do you think, could really be beneficial? Or do you think if we already know what this reality is, uh, could be harmful to our fitnesses as human. So, so great, great questions uh, on the looking at your face in the mirror and, and wondering who you are. Yeah. One striking implication of, of this theorem from natural selection is that we only see ourselves through an interface. Mm -hmm. We don't have direct access to who we really are. And so when I see my hand doing something, that hand itself is just a user interface symbol. It's an icon, it's not the truth. And what that hand is doing in space and time is not the true action that I'm taking. The true action that uh, what I'm doing in objective reality is something utterly beyond anything I know according to natural selection. All I see are avatars. Like, like if, if I see my friends in a virtual reality game, I don't see them, I see avatars. If I see my hand grabbing a steering wheel in a, a you know, virtual reality version of Grand Theft Auto, that's not me, that's an avatar hand grabbing a, an avatar <laughs> steering wheel. So the hand right here, that's just an avatar. The body that I see right here, that's just an avatar. So I am a mystery to myself, according to this, to, to natural selection. And we do know that when we look at in the mirror, all you see, as you said, is skin, hair, and eyes, but you know firsthand that there's a much richer complexity to you, that you know, your hopes, your dreams, all the rich world of your conscious experiences, all of that, you you can't see that in, in this, this is trivial compared to what's going on, quote unquote, inside. Although even the very notion of inside is is only an interface term, it's not the truth. You know, spatial inside. Yeah. So so yes, that that's one very important aspect of of this that we don't know what we really are. So then you asked, is it dangerous for us, or you know, to to know the truth? Is is there something? And <clears throat> from the point of view of evolutionary theory, natural selection. Uh, again, I'm, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm saying what our best 
scientific theories answer. I don't know if the final answer, but I'm just saying what our best theories entail right now. And, and natural selection does entail that it's harmful to know the truth in the following sense. Um, and this was my initial intuition when I went into it, to, into this whole study. It, it is very expensive, both in time and energy, to compute the truth, to resolve the truth. And every calorie that you spend on trying to see reality is a calorie that you have to go out, kill something and eat it to get that calorie. So you, you have to put yourself at risk. It takes, it, it's always a, there's a fine, there's a penalty for, for all, every calorie you spend on the truth. And so, so yes, there is a, a downside to spending time seeing the truth. If instead you could just act in ways that keep you alive long enough to reproduce without knowing the truth, then then there's going to be a punishment because a creature, an organism that's competing with you that doesn't waste its time on the truth and still acts correctly is going to beat you because you you're costing more calories to to act correctly and see the truth. So so that that's the technical answer to your question from evolutionary theory. But now there's a deeper point point of view. As a scientist, as I said, I I don't believe any scientific theories. The, the the attitude of belief is just the wrong attitude. It, I don't believe my own theories. My attitude as a scientist is, of course, I take our best current scientific theories and study them carefully and look at their implications, not because I think they're true, but because they're the best tools that we have so far, period. And, and what we know from the history of science is we have a, a penchant, a, a, an attitude of believing our current theories. So in 1890, many physicists, perhaps most physicists, thought that physics was over. Newton was right, and Newtonian physics was was the final answer, and, and bright young students should go elsewhere because physics was done. Well, that was just the wrong attitude. The, the attitude should always be as good as our current theories are, as amazing as they are, let's try to break them and get to a deeper level. And we found that there is something far, far deeper than Newton. There's Einstein's theory of special and general relativity. There's quantum theory. And it's, so once again, it's very easy for us to think, oh, now we have special relativity of gravity and quantum theory. We're done. Well, no, no. I think that we, we should, again, have the same attitude that we should have had in 1890, which is we've just begun. Let's try to break these theories and find something deeper. So so when I when I talk about natural selection and say we don't see the truth, I don't know whether we see the truth or not. Maybe mm -hmm. we do see the truth. All I'm saying is that natural selection entails that we don't. But maybe there's a deeper theory, a deeper theory of objective reality, a deeper scientific theory that will include evolution by natural selection as a special case, right? That, that's, that is a, a consistent condition we need on our deeper theories. We need to understand, for example, how Newton is a special case of Einstein. Well. We understand that as the speed of light goes to infinity, you get something like an approximation of, of Newtonian mechanics in, in Einstein. And in, in quantum theory, as you let Planck's constant go to zero, again, you get something that's like an approximation to Newton. So we, we have some understanding of the relationship of Newtonian physics to the newer theories that we have. And so I would want that whatever deeper theory, scientific theory we have should show how space time arises and within space time, how quantum theory and Einstein and quantum and, and natural selection, evolutionary theory, all arise within space time as a consequence of a deeper theory. So I'm looking myself for a deeper theory outside of space time that's mathematically precise that might allow that we see some truths, but explains why evolutionary theory entails that we see no truths, right? So that's a tall order. That, 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 but but you can see that that would be if we could do it that would be a completely consistent scientific position um, that would say natural selection says we don't see the truth but this deeper theory says we can see some truths and it explains why natural selection says we we, we wouldn't see the truth mm -hmm. and so i'm looking at a theory in which consciousness is fundamental um, mm -hmm. partly because i'm interested in the hard problem of consciousness how is brain activity and physical dynamical activity more generally mm -hmm. related to our experiences of, you know, simple things like the taste of chocolate, 
the, the feeling of velvet, the smell of a rose, and, and so forth. Those simple conscious experiences, they're correlated clearly with various kinds of neural activity. They're, these are called the neural correlates of consciousness. And uh, colleagues of mine have done tremendously good work uh, cataloging dozens, maybe hundreds of neural correlates of conscious experiences. For example, there's an area called MT, um, which is correlated uh, it's in the, roughly right over here in the in in the head <clears throat> in the temporal lobe, and activity there is correlated with your experience of motion, visual motion. And if you have a stroke, say in MT, in the left hemisphere of the brain, then you can't see any motion in the right part of the visual world. It's like a stroboscope; you see that mm -hmm. shape in that position and then that shape in that position, but you don't see the smooth motion in between. Whereas on the left hem hemifield, you do see smooth motion. So I have an apple, it's moving smoothly, and now it's snapshot, 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 no, no smooth motion. So that's, and you can also do that with a magnet. If you take a TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation device and inhibit MT, you can temporarily induce what's, what's called hemiakinetopsia, the inability to see motion in just half of the visual world but you see smooth motion in the other half. So, so we have lots of correlations like, like this between you know, neural activity or you know, inhibiting neural activity and various kinds of sensory experiences or the, or the loss of those sensory experiences. So the, the hard problem of consciousness has been to try to get a scientific theory that, that explains those correlations. And we've mm -hmm. so far utterly failed. And, and when I say utterly, there, there's not a single theory today that can account for the specific content of one conscious experience. Say, my, my experience of the taste of chocolate. Mm -hmm. There's no physicalist theory that, you know, say, starts with brain activity. And, and, and so among the theories, you know, and many of the theorists who are working on this are friends of mine are, and brilliant. I mean, these are brilliant people. Um, but there's theories like um, IIT, the integrated information theory, where it says that if you have the right causal computational architecture, then that will be or give rise to conscious experiences. And, and nice idea. There may be some really important insights there, um, but they can't explain even one specific conscious experience. What is the causal computational architecture? that must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of vanilla. And why exactly does that computational architecture have to be the taste of chocolate? Yeah. There's nothing on the table. And, and, and as you can see, it's not an easy task that they've set themselves. I'm Same thing with, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, before going to the somatic model, but I guess I know you don't have a different answer, but if you can imagine a little bit, if it's not, something more complex than space and time, and we have really complex experience as a human in life. What that thing is, you think? Maybe, I don't know, when you imagine, maybe, I know it's not scientific yet, but when you imagine what that could be. The reality beyond space time? Yeah, if you, because you did some experiment, we go with that, but of course in life, there are more complex experiences we have, very, very complex. And- Right, yeah. right, so, yeah, for most of us, we, we would say that uh, space time and what happens inside space time is complicated enough. It's hard to, <laughs> if you're making the problem even harder by saying that there's a, a reality beyond space time. And, and, and I'll just say, uh, I'll tell you, I'll answer the question in terms of what I'm pursuing in terms of the scientific theory of what's beyond space time. But I'll, I'll just mention that, that physicists are also saying this, and which is quite striking. So physicists have been working within the framework of space time for like four centuries that you know since Galileo and Newton physics has been essentially defined by mm. the description of what happens in space and time what what you know how does mass and objects and so forth behave inside space and time and but now physicists are saying just in the last 20 30 years a space time is doomed that that their own best theories. So Einstein's theory of gravity, when you pair it with quantum theory, entails that space time cannot be the fundamental nature of objective reality, there needs to be something deeper. 
space-time has to be emergent. And if you wish, we can go into some of the arguments that they give. But, but the, the, the phrase that the physicists use is space-time is doomed. So that's not me. That's physicists like Nima Arkani Hamed, uh, David Gross, and Ed Witten have, have all said at various times, space-time is doomed. And they're looking for deeper structures. And by the way, they're finding some interesting mathematical structures, things that they call, for example, the amplitude hedron, space hedron, cosmological polytopes. They're finding structures that are beyond space-time and quantum theory. When I say beyond quantum theory, <clears throat> there are no Hilbert spaces in these structures. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any Hilbert spaces, you don't have any quantum theory. So, so there, there's these structures have symmetries that cannot be expressed in space-time, but the, but are true of, for example, the scattering data at the Large Hadron Collider. The scattering amplitudes they're finding have symmetries in the data that can't be captured by space-time symmetries. So there are these deeper symmetries, so-called dual conformal symmetry, infinite infinite Yang Yang symmetries, and so forth, and moreover. When they do the computations of, you know, try to, you know, what happens when two gluons smash and five gluons goes spraying out, <clears throat> those scattering amplitudes, if you do the computations in space time, the one I just mentioned is hundreds of pages of algebra with all the Feynman diagrams and the virtual particles and so forth that you would need to account for. When you let go of space time, it's three or four terms that you can compute by hand. So you find when you let go of space time, the physicists are finding that you have to let go of space time for principled reasons. Mm -hmm. When you let go of space time, you they start to find these deeper structures that have symmetries that are right, that are true of the data, that make the mathematics simpler. So, so that's really great. New symmetries, simpler math. You're getting a, a hint that there's some something deeper beyond space time. Space time emerges, and the deepest structure that they're finding are something they call affine permutations behind all of the the amplitude hedron for example the are these things called affine permutations so there's some a combinatorial nature to the fundamental structures that they're finding but they don't but the physicists don't know what this realm is about so they're finding these mathematical structures that work but in terms of a, of a process theory that says, here's what this deeper reality is about, here's what it's up to, this is the process that's going on outside of space. There's no ideas there, right? All they've got are these, all, what they've found, the, the, the brilliant work that they've done so far is to find these incredibly powerful static structures that actually predict the scattering amplitudes, but they don't know what these structures come from. So that's just from the, the physics side. What I'm proposing is I'm trying to solve the hard problem of consciousness. And I've looked at you know what my brilliant colleagues have been doing in terms of trying to boot up consciousness from brain activity and physical dynamical systems more generally. And it, you know, so far, despite their brilliance, haven't been able to even do one specific conscious experience, not one. So I, I'm saying, well, evolution tells us that, um, you know, space-time is just a data structure and objects in space-time are merely icons that we create as we need them and we delete them. We, we garbage collect these data structures. So neurons in particular are merely data structures that we create when we need them and we delete them when we don't. Neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. So neurons could not possibly create our conscious experiences. So that's from evolution by natural selection. So natural selection suggests that it's never going to happen that we can start with brain activity and boot up consciousness because brain activity has no causal consequences whatsoever. Brain activity is, is merely an icon system that we use when we look in certain places. So I'm trying to go the other way. Let's start with consciousness. We have to get a mathematical model of consciousness, not as something that emerges from physical systems, but on its own terms. So a mathematical theory of consciousness, qua consciousness, and then have a dynamics of consciousness. So we have to have some principled reason for consciousness to be doing something. So have a dynamics of consciousness, 
And then we have to have a mathematically precise theory about how certain consciousnesses use space time as an interface to all the other consciousnesses. In other words, I have to get a theory of space time and then whatever dynamics of consciousness I propose, when I project it into a space time interface, it has to look like modern science, it has to look like Einstein's theory of gravity, it has to look like quantum theory and evolution of a natural selection. So, so the idea is that science for the last 400 years has only been studying our headset. It's not been studying objective reality more generally. It's mm -hmm. only been studying our headset. And they've done a, a, an incredibly good job of sharpening the tools of science, studying our space-time interface, our headset. Those tools, I think, I hope, are powerful enough for science to take the first leaps beyond our headset and try to get models of objective reality. Again, it will be fallible. Data never determine theories. It, this is just sort of elementary in the philosophy of science. No matter how much data we collect in all of our experiments, there will always be an infinite number of theories that are equally compatible with all the data that we have mm -hmm. and that make contradictory predictions about the outcomes of experiments we have not yet done. That's just the nature of science. Data do not determine theories. It's always a creative leap for mm -hmm. scientists to propose a theory. And even if your theory passes every experimental test that you can imagine so far, it doesn't mean your theory is right. It just means you haven't been clever enough. You're not clever enough yet to figure out the experiment that will show the failure of your theory. So that's just the nature of the beast in, in science. And so when I, I'm proposing that consciousness is fundamental, I have to propose a mathematical model of consciousness. It's a creative leap. And I then have to have a mathematically precise mapping from the dynamics of consciousness into space time. That's where I'm spending all my time right now is, mm -hmm. is working on a mathematical model of the dynamics of consciousness and trying to map it into space time with my first goal to be able to predict scattering amplitudes. I mean, that's, I'm going after that because not because it's the, perhaps the most interesting thing. It's it's the simplest thing in space time that I could try to do. Yeah. Elementary physics is far more simple than chemistry. Chemistry is simpler than biology. Biology is simpler than neuroscience. If I go after the brain first, I'm, I'm a fool. That's way too complicated. So I need to just try to get gluon scattering first. If I can do that, then there's some hope of building up to more complicated things. Yeah. That's very interesting. You mentioned about the consciousness is not related to the brain or even having any kind of, yeah, it's just merely independent beyond what we have just, but you mentioned that all these years we have been studying our brain and the headset and neglecting what objective reality. And still we don't have something concrete or even still not far yet. So, but I'm curious, what could be, do you think maybe the tools or maybe do you think if we are limited in our perception to what's objective reality, in this blue, because we have this evolution and we have us as a human and we have a limited perceptions and the tools we have. So what is really missing in this, uh, yeah, this circle? I don't know what is really missing so that we can capture what's objective reality. And you mentioned also that if you came up with a theory for explaining what it is, it have to also validate the space time like Einstein theory as well. So if you take this kind of, yeah, this path, what will be gaining for us in this maybe I don't know in science in general if we understand what is beyond the space and time and, and we have also to validate what already been done for thousands of times mentioned this is really true for most of cases so what's really missing here what kind of tools what what why do you think what's still we lacking here so that we can achieve that well there, there's a couple issues here one is we may lack the concepts needed to actually propose and understand a, a true theory of objective reality. We don't expect monkeys to understand quantum mechanics. We don't expect they have the right concepts to understand quantum theory. <clears throat> no matter how good a teacher you might be, you couldn't teach them. They simply yeah. won't get it. So it's quite possible that Homo sapiens lacks the concepts. That's just an evolutionary argument. There's a deeper argument. Mm -hmm comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And Gödel 
basically showed intuitively what he showed was no matter how much mathematical structure anyone any system discovers or invents you've only just begun there is in principle no end to the exploration of novel mathematical structure and no single formal system can ever capture all of mathematics hmm. so so there is a principled argument that i interpret to say even what we might think of as a deity can't know all of mathematics so the exploration of reality is necessarily open-ended and boundless this is great job security for scientists <laughs> This means that there is no theory of everything. There, there is perhaps a theory of everything that we've explored so far, but then Gödel assures us that what we've explored so far is basically just putting our toe in the water. We haven't even stepped into the ocean. The whole ocean is still out there. And that will still be true if, if we continue science full bore for a billion years, we still just put our toe in the water. And in no matter how sophisticated our theories are, they're they're trivial compared to what's yet to be explored. And, and so in that sense, I think it may be that the answer is we we can't understand all of reality, even a god, quote unquote, couldn't. By definition, it's it's un, unknowable. It's, it's and that's one thing that I've been exploring in this theory of consciousness is to, is to <clears throat> say, suppose that consciousness is fundamental and consciousness is all that there is. Then mathematical structure is all and only about the possible varieties of consciousness. That's, that's what it's about. In, in which case then, what is consciousness up to? Well, maybe what consciousness is up to is exploring all of this potential, all of the varieties of conscious consciousness and conscious experiences. I call this Girdle's candy store. There's this infinite candy store of possible varieties of consciousness. And what, what consciousness is up to is the endless exploration of the various varieties. And, and science is just one of the tools of exploration for, for, for meditation and other uh, activities or, or other ways of, of exploring consciousness they all have their strengths and, and perhaps their weaknesses as as well so the reason why consciousness is doing something according to this idea would be that uh it's necessarily never going to fully understand itself and the the process of understanding itself is necessarily always going to continue and so that's what consciousness is up to and then we see in that's one way of thinking about all the activities that happen in in human life science is one of them but but the humanities art literature poetry these are different ways of consciousness exploring its all of its potentials so science is not the only way of, of exploring it's just one very very powerful way but we explore it in meditation we explore it in social gatherings, we explored in personal relationships, we're exploring all the varieties and complications and complexities of conscious experience in, in a, an infinite number of ways. And, and that's one theory, it's not a theory of everything, but it's sort of like a meta theory that, that explains why there's no theory of everything and explains why there will always be this ongoing activity of endless exploration. So, and it also means that neuroscience will, some people might think that I'm uh, what I'm saying is bad for neuroscience. Uh, not at all. The fact that neurons don't exist when they're not perceived doesn't mean that we shouldn't study neuroscience. To, to the contrary, we have to study our interface. That's the only data we've got. So we, we have to study neurons and synapses and, 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 and networks of neurons, you know, systems, neuroscience. But we have to be, we have to do a lot deeper work. When we see neurons right now, we assume I see a neuron, that's because there is a neuron. 
Now we have to think more deeply. I see a neuron. What does that imply about a deeper reality, perhaps, perhaps of conscious agents? We have to reverse engineer what we're seeing and ask what it entails in this deeper reality. So, so there's job security for neuroscience in what I'm proposing as well. I guess to ask you, Professor, in that case, why do you think there may be, I don't know, don't, yeah, just make, taking the easiest path. We don't want to go, for, because it's truly hard when you try to understand what is actually built this wisdom. It's, yeah, it, it has a lot of dimension, uh, even to, to evolution and also mystical and religion. So I think it's, it's very deep. But why do you think when we speak in the science uh, currently, why do you think they, they not maybe more strides towards understanding? Let's understand that. Why, why do you think the people just believe in that and maybe yeah, disregard this idea just is not true? Well, there's a couple ways to try to answer that, that question. Um, one is I'll just use evolution again, just in the context of that theory, and then I'll try to go deeper. In evolutionary theory, it's, it's very interesting. You can ask the question, just from an evolutionary point of view, what were the selection pressures that led to our ability at logic and reason? Why, why did humans evolve logic and reason? And you might say, well, you know, perhaps we evolved that um, as a tool for finding the truth. That's one theory. But Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier, um, they have a book called The Enigma of Reason, Enigma of Reason. <clears throat> And they propose a very different idea from evolutionary theory. They propose that we're a social species. We're not that fast. We're not that strong. We are pretty smart. And if we collaborate, we can do things, right? I might not be able to pull down a woolly mammoth by myself, but if me and a few of my buddies work together, we can bring down that woolly mammoth. So we have to have tools for social networking and social coordination. And so they argue that logic and reason evolved in that framework as a tool of social persuasion. So, so I have an idea about how to bring down that woolly mammoth and I'm using the tools of logic and reason not to get to the truth, but as tools of social persuasion. And so in that context, so we evolve logic and reason according to this evolutionary idea, not to see the, not to pursue the truth, but as a social persuasion tool. And that can explain a lot of what we see in how people use logic and reason. We tend to look for data that supports what we already believe. That's called the confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. We tend to find groups of people that believe like we do, and we tend to then get stuck in the same circle of ideas. And so that's from an evolutionary point of view, why we sort of, you know, get stuck and have a hard time thinking out of the box and going to, to deeper ideas, and we find them threatening. That's, that's, that's one, one interesting framework. Again, as I said, I don't believe any scientific theories, but I study them. They're the best tools we have. Now, there, there's a Another framework that we could think of, and that is, think about this Girdle's candy store idea. In that case, if, if consciousness is fundamental and what consciousness is up to is this endless exploration of all the possibilities of the varieties of consciousness. <clears throat> well, that exploration would have, it would seem at least two big components. One is to enjoy the candy that I'm having right now. In other words, to really I mean, wherever I am right now, to explore all of that. In, 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 in Gödel's language, might be given a particular formal system to look at all the implications of that formal system. Right? There's lots of theorems to explore that are true within that formal system. But then there's another aspect, which is to go beyond that formal system, to go truly into the unknown, something that cannot, in principle, cannot be formalized within your current formal system, something brand new. Mm -hmm. Now, one can imagine that that going into the end, so there's the exploring the known, 
and then going into the genuinely unknown, the totally unknown, that is possible that that may always be a problem in the sense that we get comfortable in exploring, I, I enjoy this candy, I like chocolate, I, let me just stick with chocolate kind of attitude. And someone says, well, but there's this other flavor I'm sure you're going to like. And you, you show that to a kid, the kid will go, no, no, I just, you know, they might cry and say, no, just give me the chocolate. That's, I know I like that. Mm -hmm. So there may be this aspect to consciousness more generally, you know, that we're comfortable with the known. It's uncomfortable to go into the unknown. And so that may be another deeper reason for us not feeling comfortable about challenging our own ideas and going deeper. That may be a deep part of this whole evolution of consciousness that the next profound step is always difficult because it's letting go of the structures and concepts that we've grown comfortable with. That may be an inevitable ongoing process of conscious evolution that it's always going to be the case that the next step will be in some sense uncomfortable because it's truly stepping in to the unknown. So that's, again, I don't know if that's right, but it's, 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 it's an interesting idea to explore. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I would like to take one question from the audience here. Okay. From Tom, he asks you, um, do you adhere to any particular ontological belief or school? For instance, are your series compatible with either materialism or metaphysical idealism? or cosmophysicism, for example, or any other relevant, irrelevant aspect in what in your new work? Right, so I, I would say that uh, physicalism is contradicted by evolutionary theory. That the very language of space, time, and matter, uh, according to evolution by natural selection, is simply the wrong language to describe objective reality. And so from, from an evolutionary point of view, I would say that physicalism is the rookie mistake of taking the headset for the final reality. So I don't want to be a physicalist because I, according to our best theories, both the, the physics theories that say space time is doomed and evolution by natural selection, which says the very language of space and time is the wrong language to describe objective reality. Physicalism, you know, which I define as being the the philosophical point of view that space time and predicates of predicates of things inside space time like matter and fields and so forth is the final statement of objective reality and also the reductionist paradigm that that as you go to finer and finer smaller and smaller scales in space time you get to in some sense the deeper and more profound laws of, of nature that, that 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 reductionist physicalist framework is according to evolutionary theory mistaking the headset for the final truth it's just a rookie mistake Dualism, I don't like dualism because it's, you know, it violates Occam's razor, right? If I, I, dualism may be true, um, some, some kind of dualism may be true, um, but it's, as, as a scientist, you, you know, we, we're not going to start there. No scientist is going to start with dualism. We're going to start, we're going to try to get a unified, some kind of unified theory. Um, I, I don't like to use the term idealism to describe my idea that you might that consciousness is fundamental, partly because the word idealism in the history of philosophy has been used for a variety of different concepts, a variety of different points of view. <clears throat> and <clears throat> though there's Berkeley's idealism, there's Hegel, there's Kant, there's all sorts of different versions of idealism. And often idealism has been an anti-scientist, anti-scientific point of view. Berkeley <clears throat> proposed his idealism in part as a reaction to Newton's uh, scientific mechanistic a, a point of view and, and Barclay as a, you know, a, a bishop of the church was trying to defend the faith and, and introduced um, his idealism. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, Barclay's arguments are brilliant. I, mean, I, I love reading Barclay, it's very, very interesting, but, but um, I, I don't share his, his motivations uh, at all. And, and I, I certainly don't share the anti-science or anti-realist point of view that is often tied with idealism. So, so that's why I coined a different term for the sort of the philosophical framework that I'm working with. I call it conscious realism. And I put the word realism into my term on purpose. I'm, I'm 
being a realist about consciousness. Not, now, who knows what, what's real or not? But I'm, but I'm just saying that this theory, whether it's right or not, this theory is proposing that consciousness is the nature of objective reality. So it's, it's not an anti-realist theory of any kind. So you can see why I, I have to tiptoe around all the standard philosophical labels um, because there's landmines and misconceptions from history everywhere. And so that's why I coined a brand new phrase I call my philosophical framework, conscious realism. And I'm not saying conscious realism is correct. Uh, as I said, the probability that any scientific theory is correct is zero. Um, we can just do, all we have to do is, is the best we can do so far. So, but at least I'm distinguishing conscious realism from the other philosophical frameworks. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So since we close the end, I have a few questions. The first one about, you mentioned about the consciousness when we as a human interact with other human in this kind of, we don't know what it's actually the reality is and what could be other component or explanation because still we don't have, yeah, to pinpoint something that, oh, that's something we didn't see in reality. And even with animals or insects, how do you see this kind of interaction? So because I think that's very interesting, the consciousness of that we create a human with human and with animals or insects. Yeah. Right. So uh, for those who are interested in, in the real scientific details of what we're doing here, we have a paper that we've published called Objects of Consciousness. So if you just Google my name and Objects of Consciousness, and then we, we have some other work that's built on that where we're, we're building mathematically precise networks of conscious agents. So this is like network information theory. That's the, the mathematics that's required, network information theory. Very, very difficult. Many of the basic theorems of network information theory are not yet known. Many, this is, this is new, I mean, the advance of, you know, the, of, of social networks and the internet and so forth has forced us to start to understand network information theory. And, and it's very, very difficult. The, the basic theorems are very, very difficult, but that's what we're, what we're up to. It's a, a network information theoretic framework, in which there are these conscious agents interacting. And, and when agents interact, they create new agents they instantiate new agents. So there's, I'm not just one conscious agent, I'm two, but I'm not just two, I'm a whole lattice of interacting conscious agents. And so there's gonna be bottom up and top down flow of information through this network. And, and the information that what's flowing are conscious experiences. We use information theory to describe the conscious experience, but, but what's really flowing are conscious experiences. And we give an information theoretic mathematical description of it. And so, so that's, that's what we're up to. And it's, you know, the mathematics is, is, is difficult, but one, I'll just point out one interesting thing that's coming out of this. The, the idea would be that reality, according to this model, is a vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Think the Twitterverse as an example, right? There are literally tens of millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets. No user could possibly interact with all the tweets or all the users, right? It'd be overwhelming. So what do we do if we're trying to grasp this vast Twitterverse and we can't deal with it directly? We use visualization tools. Ideally, you'd have some virtual reality headset that you could stick on that, that takes all of that complexity, the billions of tweets, millions of users, compresses it down into something trivial, some colorful objects in my three-dimensional space-time headset data structure that are doing certain actions that I can understand. And that helps me to see, for example, what's trending in New York versus what's trending in London, or zooming out and seeing what's trending in all of Europe versus what's trending in all of China or something like that. So we, we, use visual, we have visualization tools. And that's what space time is. It's just a visualization tool. But, but how do I create that visualization tool? So it turns out the <clears throat> one way to do that, one way to compress the data of conscious agent network is to look at the long-term behavior, the asymptotic, technically it's called the asymptotic behavior. And it turns out <clears throat> in the Markovian dynamics of these networks, you can describe the asymptotic behavior with circulant matrices, um, these are permutation matrices. Uh, effectively, we're finding the asymptotics can be described by affine permutations, which is exactly the deepest structure I mentioned earlier that the physicists are finding that lies beneath 
amplitudehedra and the things that they're finding behind space-time. So my goal is to start with the dynamics of conscious agents, which is network information theory, data compress it by looking at its asymptotics. That, that data compression gives us affine permutations. Affine permutations now, the physicists tell us, can lead to the amplitudehedron, and the amplitudehedron can take us all the way into space-time and predict scattering amplitudes. So that's the path I'm hoping to take from the dynamics of conscious agents all the way to gluon scattering at the Large Hadron Collider. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So maybe the, the quick question we ask was, do you think, based on what you said, you say, we think we live in simulation? Do you think that we are living in simulation? Great question. There's similarities between what I'm saying and, you know, Nick Bostrom and Elon Musk's ideas about simulation theory, and there are big differences. So the similarity, both simulation theory and what I'm talking about say that space-time is, as you perceive it right now in objects, are not the final reality. They're just a data structure. Mm -hmm. And so we agree on that. But where we disagree is that the simulation theory says that this space-time data structure is the result of some computer programmer at a lower level of reality, right? And that programmer could also, in their world, could be the simulation of yet a lower level. And they go all the way down to some, some base level. And that base level is, is always assumed to be a space-time physical reality. So they assume that the ground of all the simulation is space-time, some kind of space-time framework. And I deny that. I, I, I say that evolution by natural selection entails that that cannot be the right language for the base level. That's one, one difference. The second difference is <clears throat> they assume in the simulation theory that the right complexity in the computer algorithm can create consciousness or perhaps the illusion of consciousness. Some people say there is no such thing as consciousness. Maybe there's the illusion of consciousness, but so I'll take both. In the case of where they claim it's, it creates genuine consciousness, um, that's the hard problem of consciousness and that's not been solved. So they're, they're making an assumption that, that computer programs properly with the proper complexity can create consciousness. Um, the burden of proof is on the person who claims that. There, there is no evidence yet of a theory that can, that can explain that. And if, and if you say, no, I don't think that it creates genuine consciousness, it creates the illusion of consciousness. So Dan Dennett and Keith Frankish, for example, or take that point of view. And I say, fine. And, and you know, the, the, they're, they're brilliant guys. And I had a, a wonderful conversation with Keith Frankish. He's, a, he's an incredibly brilliant philosopher. But what I argued with him, and he, he agreed, is that what they now have to do instead is to give us a mathematically precise theory of how specific computational processes or neural processes give rise to specific illusions. Why is this brain process or this computational process the illusion of the taste of chocolate? Why is it that it could not be the illusion of the smell of vanilla? They still owe us, they don't get off scot-free by saying it's an illusion. There's still hard work to do here. And, and, and Keith, of course, completely understands that. But um, maybe other people don't. So there's still, this is an unsolved problem, how consciousness or the illusion of consciousness comes from computer programs. And, and so... I don't have that problem, right? I have other problems, I'm, but I'm starting with consciousness and trying to boot up what we call the simulation from consciousness. They're starting with a physicalist framework and they're hoping to boot up consciousness or the illusion of consciousness from a physicalist simulation theory. So you can see our, our points of view on that are completely opposite. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. I'm pissed because you spent most of your life, um, yeah, understanding this problem, working on that. What kind of feeling that you still live on, on yeah, get, yeah, you, you, you really push on that, but you still not maybe sure which direction we will, will lead to. What kind of thoughts come to you? Do you still have like some terms of sort of ego? I don't know, how do you feel? Because you spend, you're passionate about that all your life in, in this thoughts. And I'm curious, how, how it affecting you that, you're still passionate and, and you, don't, you don't know where we have to go, or whether it's true or not. What kind of thoughts comes to your mind? Right. Yeah, it's, um, I think earlier on mm. in, in my career, I 
believed that we could get a theory of everything and the the um the passion came from we're getting close we'll, we'll understand it all mm -hmm. and as as you go on and study you know what the philosophers of science tell you and then you start to look at the implications of our current scientific theories and you look at Gödel's incompleteness theorem you, know, you you start to take a longer view and the the notion of a theory of everything mm. starts to look a, a little bit simplistic and and then you begin to realize um, that things that you were certain are true, as you learn more, you realize that's just been a, a pathetic mistake that humans have repeated century after century of thinking that they're there, we've got it, Newton is right, Einstein is right, quantum theory is right. It, it's, it's so it's a it's a shock to this every time you realize that something you deeply thought was true is isn't it hurts but it's it's also liberating it's it's a it's a funny dual feeling of a, a deep disappointment and yet an opening up of a new vista and so for me now the it's it's, it's like an acquired taste, right? <laughs> you, you, the first taste of beer isn't necessarily, you don't like it the first time, but you know, yeah. it, it, it's an acquired taste. The, the idea that um, I won't arrive is an acquired taste. I'm, I'm starting to get the idea that, well, it's not about arriving, it's, it's enjoying mm. the process of exploration yeah. for its own sake and, and Actually, the more you think about it, wow, how boring it would be if we could actually write down everything in a single equation. And that's when they go, there it is. Problem solved. Nothing more to do. Yeah. That's sort of what we were all going for. But but actually, this other point of view, which says, no, no, there's the problem solved so far, but you've li literally only just put your toe in the water. It's endless exploration and even, quote unquote, God is only putting her toe in the water. There, there's no way the exploration is necessarily endless. That is an acquired taste. But once you start to go there, you realize that maybe that's what I've been longing for all the time anyway. I didn't really want to know it all because mm. then all of a sudden it would have been boring. Maybe I didn't know it, but I really wanted this joy of endless exploration but it comes at the price of humility it it means that i will forever know that i am profoundly ignorant about all the possibilities that i have not yet explored profoundly ignorant and uh, getting used to that I, I i don't know but i think you are really a true representation of science and you can imagine how many people love you and appreciate you for what you're doing even if it's right or wrong but that's something we have to aspire for each science like you so i deeply respect what you're doing and um, i'm curious what could be the most important quality maybe gained while still in this endless exploration what could be important quality for you you have gained it, 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 it does feel, I mean, I, I don't know if that's right, but it, it certainly feels better than knowing it all. So, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. And lastly, maybe you, what may be the best advice was given to you and was a life changing. I don't know if you received any advice or so. Maybe in professional one or maybe in general, was a life changing or the way of thinking. Hmm. I don't know what could be advice was well, given to you and was life changing. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, I got lots of help along the way from lots of brilliant people that helped me. I, w one person who had a profound impact on me was um, uh, my advisor, David Marr at MIT. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience and a, a master's in mathematics and was in the artificial intelligence lab at, at MIT. And, and what I learned from him, uh, I, I was an undergraduate at UCLA when I took a class where we studied one of his papers and his paper grabbed my attention because he was basically saying, if you want to understand how like human vision works, how human neuroscience works, you've got to build one. You have to have mathematical precision. You have to build something. If you can't build something that works, 
you don't understand it. And that really grabbed my attention. No more hand waves. So, see, so in the religious background that I was brought up, it was about belief, but there was no proof and there was no, no attempt to, to nail down and show that you were right. You just believed it. And when I questioned, actually, my a minister told me not to question, just believe. And I, I knew that that wasn't, that, 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 that didn't seem right. So with David Marr, what I saw in him was a way to get beyond hand waves and to really do no nonsense work, have mathematical theories, do experiments, and then build something. And if you couldn't build, so we actually worked on building working robotic vision systems. And, you know, it's decades later, and there are now self-driving cars. This stuff leads to technology, but it's in the process of actually building something that works that you get rid of um, the false assumptions and all the things you were sure are true that turn out to be false. It's really cold water in your face uh, about all the things that, that are nonsense. And we, we all have lots of nonsense beliefs. And so, so that's the key is we're full of nonsense beliefs. It, the best thing we can do is get rid of the nonsense as quickly as possible. And so doing mathematics, building stuff and seeing if it works. So I learned that from David and I, I'm, I'm grateful. That's very inspiring. Uh, I think that's something, yeah, I really like that so much. Thanks so much, Professor Donald. I think that was very inspiring and uh, yeah, huge respect for what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's really, truly uh, worth more thinking and contemplation about what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. It was a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. So thank okay. you, Anthony, Professor. I wish you a great day. Thank you.